So the light is green. I hope you can all hear me well. Can anybody not hear me? It's wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful to see all these faces. Wonderful to see some of you again. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the Humboldt Forum für Wirtschaft. Thank you to this wonderful team uh, to set up this very ambitious project of having a full day symposium with some very interesting topics. Some interesting topics that matter to us all. From geopolitical challenges to climate change. From security, economy, to China, and again to climate change. And today, this panel is about climate change. And I feel honored and humbled to have a wonderful panel here beside me to discuss with us today some of the things that are important, what climate change will bring as consequence. So first of all, two words to that about our topic today, and then I'll introduce the panel. So if we talk about climate change, we've all heard about it, the IPCC scenarios, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 2.4, 3, what's going to happen in the next 50, 200 years? What is our end scenario? When do we reach our tipping points? We're talking about carbon dioxide, gigatons of carbon dioxide budget, temperature rise. But a lot of times when we discuss these things, we forget also societal impact. What does it mean for us? How do we live with this? How is it going to change our cities, our societal disparities? Who is it going to impact the most? Also the differences between Western cultures and developing countries or economies. There are disparities north to south, east to west, income, gender equalities. How are girls and young women impacted in developing economies? So this is going to be actually the setting for today's panel. And I would like to introduce these wonderful guests here that we have. Well, first of all, we're going to have a note from Dr. Oluvatoyin Adeyonvo. I practiced that name. It's wonderful to learn new names from different cultures. From Lagos, Nigeria. She cannot be here in person with us today. I had a wonderful a phone call with her in preparation to our meeting today. Um, there's a recording that we're going to hear where she's going to be reporting live from the ground, live from, or not live in a streaming, but she has recorded something in Lagos talking about the situation she's in directly. She's a senior lecturer of the Department of Public Law, Faculty of Law at the University of Lagos, a solicitor and advocate of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, and the founding director of the Center for Climate Change and Sustainable Development, a research and advocacy-based not-for-profit organization based in Lagos. She holds a PhD in International Environmental Law from the Faculty of Law, University of Dundee, United Kingdom. She's also the co-editor of the book titled Climate Change, Justice, and Human Rights, an African Perspective, published by the Pretoria University Law Press in 2022. We'll be hearing her in a few seconds. I'm also very honored to have Katrin Henneberger here with us today. She's a member of the Parliament for the Green Party and activist for climate justice from Rheinland. Her focus is on climate justice and she has accompanied the World Climate Conference for several years. As a member of the Committee Economic Cooperation and Development, as well as a member of the Committee Climate Protection and Energy, she works to ensure that our global responsibility is implemented. In her area, and the Rhinish mining area, she's fighting to preserve villages, forests, and nature threatened by the Gatzweiler and Hambach open cast coal mines, things that we've been seeing over the last few months in media. 
Thank you very much for coming here, Katrin. We also have with us today Julia Sandner. She will start in August to lead the regional program Energy Security and Climate Change Latin America of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung based in Lima. She's currently undergoing the in-house preparation program for her assignment abroad and she's very excited for the move in August. Previously, she was consultant in the Sub-Saharan Africa Department with responsibility for climate and energy Sub-Saharan African program, among others. She started her work at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in 2016 as an officer in the Department Human Resources Abroad. She studied Romance and English at the University of Augsburg and Swansea and Economics at the Universities of Freiburg and Basel. Julia, it's great to have you here in the panel. And last but not least, we also have Dr. Benjamin Schraven. He's a migration expert, consultant, and research fellow of the German Institute of Development and Sustainability. He holds a PhD in the development studies from the University of Bonn. He has conducted migration-related consultancy work for the European Union, the World Bank, the International Organization for Migration, and various UN organizations and departments and German institutions such as the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. He focuses mainly on human mobility in the context of climate change, migration policy, governance, and migration and development interlinkages. That means how are things interdependent from each other. Benjamin also frequently answers questions in the German and international media on the topic of climate migration. And he will also publish a nonfiction book on this subject this summer. Great to have you here. If I may, Benjamin, I think I would like to start with you because there is something that's very important that you've been, or in this context that we've been talking about, how climate change is impacting society and how climate change will impact or can impact migration. But we always hear this term migration refugees. Um, maybe you can share some light on how we should understand that term and maybe the complexity behind it. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, thank you for this, this good question. Uh, See, we, we have some uh, very popular narratives on this, this whole climate issue uh, in a sense that um, all of a sudden in a few years from now, maybe in a few decades from now, Europe um, is going to face like a huge um, migration or refugee crisis because of people being displaced by, by climate change, people from uh, many parts of Africa, parts of Asia, in the millions and millions, desperately trying to reach European shores. Um, this narrative doesn't really... Um, is not really sound with what we see in, 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 in the research activities focusing on climate change and new mobility. New mobility being an umbrella term for migration and forced displacement. Um, this whole relationship is, is very complex as, as migration decisions are generally quite complex. I mean, even in areas that already today are very uh, severely impacted by um, the adverse effects of climate change, uh, we see that people move or are on the move for various reasons, climate change just being one factor. Um, so, in reality, it's, it's really quite hard to, to define when is a climate refugee a climate refugee because um, it, it would mean that the impacts of climate change are somewhat dominant in this migration or forced displacement decision. And that's really, really a, a hard thing to, to do, a hard thing to achieve. Um, and it, as, we, as we look around in, in, in in the policy sphere, uh, in legal terms, we, we don't have uh, um, generally accepted definitions for terminologies just like climate refugee or climate migrant. And that's 
partly because of what I just explained. Um, but on the other hand, and just to, to finish, um, nevertheless, and, and despite all those technicalities, and despite those technicalities, um, it is an important, somewhat important terminology because otherwise we might skip important issues such as climate justice and totally, um, you know, move it out of the equation. I mean, we also have, a, as a global north, uh, have a responsibility uh, for, for things which are going on in the global south. Um, and it's because of historical greenhouse gas emissions, but not only due to that. There are many things to add, but I leave it just like that. Thank you. No, thank you for that, um, Benjamin. I think what you're touching on is the intersectionality of migration as well as the complexity of climate change in general. And maybe before I will go on um, on this term, I think we should maybe hear a voice from Lagos briefly and then hear what her perspective is. So now we are actually primed on talking about climate refugees what it really means, and maybe we can hear what Oluva Toyan has to say to that. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to join you from Lagos, Nigeria. My name is Oluwa Toyi Adejongo. I am a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos. Unfortunately, I'm unable to attend in person. However, I've prepared a short presentation for my panel session um, climate change as an amplifier of social disparities. There are several dimensions of social disparities, including socioeconomic status, health, access to resources, and vulnerability to climate-related hazards. Social disparity or inequality refers to unequal access to and use of resources across various domains, which results in disparities across gender, race, ethnicity, class, and other important social markers. Environmental degradation, including climate change, aggravates pre-existing patterns of discrimination and vulnerabilities. This is because climate change acts as a threat multiplier and its impacts are felt most, most severely by those already on the margins. While the impact of climate change is felt by all, it is important to recognize that its impacts are not evenly distributed, and this impact can intensify existing social disparities. The adverse impact of climate change is creating new, new vulnerabilities and resulting in both within country inequalities and across country inequalities. There are three main channels through which climate change acts as an amplifier of social disparities, namely increasing the exposure of the disadvantaged groups to the adverse effects of climate change, increasing their susceptibility to damage caused by climate change, and decrease in their ability to cope and recover from the damage suffered. And by this, I mean the ability to reduce vulnerabilities and their capacity for mitigation and adaptation. My discussion today will focus on the third channel, focusing on the capacity to reduce vulnerability and especially how migration can be a mitigation and adaptation tool. Disparity and inequality in the context of climate change has been a persistent issue of discussion amongst um, several factions, including developed, developing, least developed, and countries in transition. With regards to across-country inequalities, the debates are usually focused on climate justice issues, such as historical responsibilities for climate change, and the consequence responsibility for financing mitigation and adaptation efforts, which includes climate finance and technology transfer. With regards to within country inequalities, the debates are usually focused on um, issues such as health, water, sanitation, um, access to land, land tenure security, and migration. 
And I, as you can imagine, the list is endless. Now, as a result of the negative impact of climate change and the disparities resulting therefrom, there are conflict regions emerging because of climate-related resource scarcities, and certain, and certain social groups are primarily affected by this. Africa and several countries in Africa, um, Africa is one of the regions most impacted by the adverse effect of climate change, and of course, several, several countries in Africa as well. Africa has contributed the least to historical emissions, but it is one of the regions impacted the most. This is amplified by the fact that it is also an, an emerging conflict area because of natural resource scarcities. The reasons for Africa's vulnerability are diverse and includes, and it includes its um, economic dependency on climate-related activities and products, low adaptive capacity and high dependence on ag agro-ecosystems for livelihood, and exposure to damaging climate risk, including extreme droughts, flooding, and storms. This is played out in several countries in the Horn of Africa. Evidence from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the IPCC's report, suggests that changes in, rain, in rainfall patterns amplifies existing tensions and vulnerabilities in conflict regions. For example, in water-stressed areas with existing tensions between groups or states over a water um, source, the impact of climate change on water resources might increase tensions, particularly in the absence of strong institutional capacity to mediate. Sudan's civil war is often described as the first modern climate change induced conflict. When it comes to the issue of migration and women and girls, there is emerging evidence that climate change is a contributing factor to worsening sexual and gender-based violence. And of course, this should be um, a common concern. Violence against women intersects with socio-political and economic dynamics, including armed conflicts, displacement, and resource scarcity, which results in the feminization of vulnerabilities. It will be incorrect to suggest, however, that these tensions and conflicts are caused by climate change alone. However, because climate change is a threat amplifier, it contributes to influencing these factors. Um, these factors interact and play a key role in translating climate change into conflict risk. So to what extent is climate-related migration imminent? And how should the West deal with it? How should developed countries deal with it? But not just developed countries, how should um, developing countries themselves, how should they deal with it? How should regional bodies and intergovernmental agencies and organizations, how should they deal with these um, issues? All countries are impacted by climate change, whether they are historical emitters, that is developed countries, or developing countries that are not historically responsible for the climate crisis, but are impacted nonetheless. As a result of the negative impact of climate change, research points to the fact that climate-related migration is imminent. And by this, we mean human mobility, the migration that occurs in the context of climate change. So the key question is, is climate change causing people to move? Is it causing migration? Human mobility is usually influenced by different factors. The decision to move is rarely, if ever, the result of climate change alone. Rather, human mobility results from a combination of factors, including climate change impacts, an individual's aspiration, capacity and vulnerability, and other contextual factors or drivers, including political, conflicts within a region or within a country, 
demographics, economic, and social factors. Key development sectors across Africa have already experienced widespread loss and damage due to climate change, including biodiversity loss, water shortages, decreasing food production, loss of lives, and reduced economic growth. The, re the current trajectory in global emissions leads to increasingly severe extreme heat, droughts, flooding, and coastal erosion, which will undermine livelihood and make parts of the continent less habitable in the coming decades. If unplanned and poorly managed, such movements risk adding stress in already fragile places, potentially heightening tensions around land and water resources. Yet a potentially worse outcome would see people stranded in places, and by this we mean, I mean forced immobility, as a result of poverty, age, disability, or legal barriers, leaving them highly exposed and vulnerable to increasingly hazardous climatic conditions. So how should we deal with it? Under the right conditions, human mobility can be an effective adaptation strategy in response to, to climate variability. This calls for policymakers and other stakeholders to begin discussing and addressing these issues at the global, regional, and domestic levels, including within existing intergovernmental mechanisms and regional um, policies as well. A starting point is to acknowledge that climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies that anticipate and plan for climate mobility are urgently needed to strengthen the resilience of people, especially women and girls, whether they decide to move or to stay. The African Union Climate Change and Resilience Development Strategy and Action Plan um, for the year 2022 to 2023 to 2032 is a good starting point. This is because it recognizes that movement or migration is an adaptation strategy. In conclusion, there's an urgent need for targeted action and comprehensive strategies to address the disproportionate impact of climate change on vulnerable and marginalized communities. More importantly, the adaptation goals need to be capitalized through climate finance that responds to the needs of the global south. Developed countries cannot be leaders if they do not show up, and they need to show up and be on track to deliver on their several promises including finance for adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. Thank you so much for listening. So that was already a very impressive lecture in itself, and I could uh, listen to another half an hour. It's uh, so rich in the insights. Um, and then I'm just going to jump right over to you, Julia, also with your experience um, at the Stiftung with Sub-Saharan projects and your division. And I just want to add something to it. I mean, the World Bank um, estimates that by 2050, there are going to be 216 million people displaced due to climate um, the International Environmental Program projects there would even be 1.2 billion people being impacted directly, indirectly. What is your take um, on that, especially overseeing some of the projects that, you, that you've been involved in, in the past? Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think it's always quite difficult with these projections, as we don't know how many Oops, how many people in the end will migrate. Um, there are so many factors that will change or could change these numbers as well, like how will we 
will we perform in the next years and what kind of adaptation and mitigation efforts we can, can do. So, therefore, it's, it's quite difficult to say these numbers will be the correct numbers. Furthermore, we don't know how this, how this migration... Can you hear me in the back? Okay. We, we don't know how that migration in the, in the end will, will work. So, it might be that... <laughs> okay, um, it can, it's, it's a lot migration within the region and as we heard before, migration always is a d decision that you take in a special moment and it's different factors. But one big factor is your financial in, uh, measurement that you have. Can I finance migration? Can I go to Europe or can I only go to another place in my region where I have a safer life, where there is fertile soil, where I can have a better life than in my original country. And maybe I will move back if I, I have to migrate because of, of an event that happens, a drought, a, a flood, whatever. So I might migrate to one place and go back later. But as we heard, quite often, it's the men that migrate. And the women, disabled people, poor people, they will stay behind and they don't migrate to other places. They will just stay there and the men bring the money. So there's a lot of things that come into that topic and we have to focus on all that different points in the future and see as well how we can help the people that have to stay back. They can't migrate, and I think that is a big issue as well. Mm. Uh, th thank you for that, um, Julia. If I may just build on that, just from my own history, my own African-American history of my ancestors being forcibly removed from the continent of Africa, but now are they going to be like new waves coming up, and how do we actually see that? So with all the interdependencies, um, and then looking at you, uh, Katrin, um, climate change is measurable. Climate change is already here, and it's already impacting us globally. Um, what is your take on that from your perspective of the urgency that we need to do something? Well, in uh, different parts of the world, uh, climate crisis is already a cruel reality. And this year we are facing El Niño, it's a climate phenomenon in the Pacific, but that mean, means that there will, high, there will be high temperatures, there will be floods and droughts in different regions of the world. So the climate crisis is truly nothing that we can debate or something that will happen in the future, it's already here. And also in terms of um, how the climate crisis is affecting different regions, um, so, for example, we have the, the islands in the Pacific um, who will lose their land um, even if we are, will reach the goal that we will not go further than 1.5 degrees. Um, and losing the land, the island, also means losing the culture, losing the history. So we have to figure out a way um, how to deal with the situation that people are losing their land and how can they live in other regions of the world peacefully because this is a human right. So climate crisis is a question of human rights. And also in the Sahel region, in Africa, another example, there will be regions not livable in the future. And so we have to find answers of, for this question now. How we can, so for example, on international level, create um, something like a loss and damage fund, um, which helps especially these kind of regions who are mostly affected. And um, at the last UN climate conference, there was a decision made to, um, to create a loss and damage fund, and, but right now there are the negotiations going on how we can achieve that this is truly a climate just fund, where also the countries who are most responsible, like Germany, um, are also paying the fair price. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Katrin. May I just build on that briefly and, and stay with you? Because what you're mentioning is, I think we also need new metrics. So it's not only about GDP and economic growth, 
You're talking about loss of culture. You're talking about human rights. Um, there is something else, and are we actually measuring correctly? Are we making this transparent enough? Do we have to rethink our metrics? Um, maybe what we should rethink is uh, to talk about the climate crisis problem. Um, because the climate crisis is a cultural problem, it's a problem about our uh, economic system, it's a problem about um, patriarchal structures, it's also a problem about colonialism. Um, so in uh, 2009, at the UN Climate Conference in Madrid, I met with a um, the representative of indigenous uh, groups in Brazil, and she said to me that the climate crisis for her communities is nothing new. It's there since the Europeans came, since extractivism exists in their regions. And so we have to think about the climate crisis um, as a question about how our economics works, how we are dealing as global society, how we will deal together with this global crisis and um, to find a climate just answer to that. Um, so Julia, listening to what Katrin has just mentioned, um, so really good on point, you also said that you know, to combat climate change, we also need strong democracies. Yeah. Well, um, as we maybe saw it as well during COVID-19, where at first we were all looking to Assyrian, um, yeah, to other regimes and said, well, they do better than we do in democracies because they can just put their matters through. Afterwards, we saw it wasn't the truth. So in the end, democracies worked better on problems, on complex problems. And I think it's the same as climate change, a quite, important thing that we, that we see right now in Germany is we have the possibility to participate and to, participa to, participate and to as well tell our, our own opinion and we can do that because we live in a democracy. Um, as well, we can can see what are the goals, what are the achievements, what are the, is the progress, where, where do we stand right now? And we can ask our leaders, our well, members of parliament, they are right here, and we can ask them and say, hey, what are you doing? And, or I can tell them, I, I don't go with you, I, I don't see your point, I see it differently. And we are free to do that. And I think that is really a big, big thing that we have here and we can be um, glad that we live here in Germany. And with all that progress, it's, I think it's much easier to, to work on climate protection. And the same is it's an international project that we have to work on. And therefore we need negotiations. We see that we have a lot of contracts, a lot of treat, uh, treaties now. And we can do that if we are open and we can work together and we can yeah, share our opinions. And if you don't have democracy as a base, it makes it much, much more difficult, as we saw it as, as well last year with the COP, where the civil society couldn't share their opinion or they were in places where they were almost unseen for the whole public and for the whole world. So therefore I think if we want to change something and want to protect our climate, it's as well very important that we have democracy as a base. And maybe going a step further, as we heard from Nigeria, that we have a democracy, but as well it's, it's you have a lot of places in Nigeria where the state and the statehood is really weak. And then people are kind of lost. There is not, no help from the state. The, the help from the state can't reach that regions. So you have conflicts of herders and farmers because of the drought. And 
if you don't have a state that can go there and help the people, there will be terrorists, there will be bandits, and they step into the place where the state should be. And then all this crisis will just get more difficult, and we can't even work on the problems that will be more deep because of climate change. So I think it's a whole, yeah, it's a big picture. <laughs> It's may, well, we won't resolve it today, but just keep that in mind as well when you go on the street to tell what is your opinion. Um, keep that in mind. That's my, my, yeah, my point today. I think that's a very, a very pertinent uh, point. To, before we go into the solutions or maybe ideas how we can, how we can mitigate, um, building on the democracy part again, Benjamin, democracy also means listening to a lot of different stakeholders. There are a lot of different influences coming together. Um, we have uh, ecological, economical factors. We have different stakeholders um, that are you know, more impacted by loss of land or not access to clean water, etc. So how can we actually approach the complexity of it? Yeah, it's a systemic challenge and sometimes I feel we're overwhelmed and we don't know where to start. Yeah, I think it, it, it reminds me a bit of the discussions we had early on with all the regulation and bureaucracy going on in Germany. Um, but I think it's a huge question whether it comes to, well, migration, governance, environmental governance, uh, who does better, authoritarian regimes or democracies? Um, I think democracies do better, but I mean, you just need to be patient, right? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's all about it. But I mean, we, we've heard it now for, uh, for several times. I mean, Olbert Yun said it, uh, Yulia said it. Uh, basically, uh, when it comes to, let's talk again about the impacts of climate change. Uh, there's, we have been talking about the, 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 the linkages, which are very complex between climate change and new mobility. Um, that might might lead to um, also to situations of, of forced displacement, but I mean also the the linkages between climate change and conflicts um, are there. Um, Oliver Tuyun says use the terminology amplifier of threats or amplifier of risk. That is definitely the case. Uh, but fortunately for all of us, there are no. Um, automatisms, or we don't have something like a climate change determinism, eco-determinism, whatever um, term you would like to use for that. And that's also because of democracy, uh, because a very important uh, mediating factor are the capacities of states and the legitimacy, legitimacy of states. And um, those ones are oftentimes or usually higher in democracies as compared to uh, authoritarian regimes, not to mention fragile statehood. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the answer is um, let's go for democracy, but we just need to be a bit, we just need to have a bit of patience, I guess. I understand. Unfortunately, more than half of the global population do not live in a democracy, and only 6% of the global population live in a full-blown democracy. Um, so the, the numbers are a little bit worrying. Um, Katrin, when, when we talk about all these factors coming together, and I don't want to sound alarmistic. I mentioned the 1.2 billion people being impacted, and, and I know numbers can be thrown around, and by 2050, there are numbers saying that 3.5 billion people are going to be impacted by food insecurity. So there's so many numbers out there, and not to sound alarmistic, but in a way, our house is already on fire. Yeah. So the question is, what could be like first steps on approaching this complexity for a systemic change? Um, so maybe the first step is to include the voices who are most affected um, at the UN Climate Conference, but also in our national debate about the climate crisis. Um, in our discussions like we're doing this evening with the, um, well, with, with the video in front of our discussion. So, uh, voices from the most affected regions are heard. And for me, what I learned in the last years is that the solutions um, for climate justice 
are mostly found in communities, uh, in projects leading by women. And so we have to hear more um, about their wisdom. wisdom. And also it's very important, um, like very concrete. The next um, SABSTA, it's a conference between the huge UN climate conference. It will be in Bonn. It's every year in Bonn. And every year we have problems with uh, people, um, young people especially, arriving from, for example, different um, countries of Africa and have huge problems with getting their visa, have huge problems with uh, finding fa the fund to travel to Bonn. And, but it's very important that at this UN climate conference where the negotiations are going on, um, that they are also represented there. And um, it's very sad to say that, um, well, the, the idea of the UN climate conference is that every country has one vote. And in the end, it's a huge compromise uh, and everyone has to be listened to. But the truth is, so this is the idea, and it's a beautiful idea, but the truth is that, of course, the um, industrialized countries have too much power. And mostly it's also about geopolitics and not only about how we can save the climate crisis. Um, at the next UN climate conference, we have a leader um, <laughs> who is very close to the oil industry. Um, so, we, on national, international level, we have a huge problem with democracy. We have a huge problem with, with the question of which voices are getting heard. And so as long as we don't include the most affected areas, as long as we don't listen to the solutions in, um, from these communities, um, then, then we, will, we will not be able to, um, to tackle this crisis. Because, well, in Germany, we are very lucky uh, first, we uh, have a uh, huge infrastructure, um, and secondly, we are because our because we are living in the middle of Europe. Um, our geography is quite lucky in terms of climate crisis, so we we don't feel the effects of the crisis. Um, even we are one of the biggest polluter in the world. Um, so we have to change the discussion about the crisis, we have to include the voices, and we have to, um, to look for a solution, and find solution, which means that um, the right for having a peaceful life um, is meant for everyone on this planet. Um, but thank you very much, Katrin. I think it's a very good point where you're talking about um, have, making those voices heard and, uh, and visible and tangible. Um, if, I may, if I may build on that, uh, Julia, because that's actually already opening the door and um, possible solutions and um, maybe building platforms for these new solutions. Now, you've been involved and you're going to be running that also in Latin America um, starting in August. It's about making projects happen on the ground. And Oliver Toyen was talking about that. What is happening there on the ground? Um, how can we get those forces focused, those projects focused, those solutions there, the awareness, the funding? I don't know. Well, um, well first, yes, um, I think it's as well a, a big thing that we are working on and quite often, it happens that we um, forge some solutions here far away from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and then we go there, implement something, and might miss the goal. Well, I remember when I was traveling to, the, uh, to Cabo Verde, uh, the islands in, in front of Senegal, it was not because of climate change, but it was a volcanic eruption and people lost half of the village. And then the EU came and they built houses 
somewhere on the island. And nobody moved there. They just, they saw, okay, there are nice houses, but nobody moved there. The people stayed in their village and they came with sledgehammers to try to get their houses out of the cold lava. And for me, it was so, I, was, I stood there, I, was, I couldn't understand how people can stay there with a sledgehammer just try to get their, their life back, you know? And the problem was nobody talked to the people. They just looked for a place that is safe from volcanic eruption and they built houses. But all the fertile soils that are close to the volcan, so if the people want to grow their, their food, they have to be close to where their village was all the years. And that is what quite often happens if we do development aid. That we think about some solutions, but when we implement them, they, they won't work. And you all are economists, and we talk a lot about um, yeah, plant economy and market economy. And quite often it happens that we here in Germany say, of course, we want to have market economy, social market economy. But when we do the law development aid, it, it looks like we just do like it was plant economy. So I think there is many things that we have to, to think about and to change and yeah, generate ownership as well in the countries. Because, well, they have to feel that it is their project, not a project from abroad that is implemented. And we have to work together and um, therefore, yeah, that's what I, I pledge today, that we, we have to, to rethink our development aid and how we can implement things. And maybe from my work, what we are going to do, we really we are in contact with the people and we work on the different levels. We work with civil society as well, with politicians, communal, communal politicians, on national and international um, politicians. So we really try to connect the different levels and to find a good solution that really works in the different countries. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I still want to challenge us a little bit right now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's sounding very, very much as if we're focused. I mean, we had the Kyoto Protocol 1, we had the Pre-Kyoto 2, mainly focused on CO2, then we had the Paris Agreement with 1.5 degrees, but also the pledge of $100 billion per year that the countries will bring that in. Make that. It didn't happen. Yeah, we failed miserably getting that fund together. What is happening, Benjamin? Are we, are we losing sight of our goals? Um, and especially here with our economic audience here, how can we get that focus going? Are we losing sight? Um, yes, to some degree, sure. But, um, <laughs> Well, I could be uh, now a bit cynical and say, well, um, let's wait and see. I mean, uh, if... Now, you, you're an American. Probably you can translate the term Leidensdruck uh, to English. <laughs> pressure, pressure due to suffering. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe it's about that. I mean, it's about so many things. Also, here in mm. Germany, uh, we are reluctant when it comes to so many things. Um, in the end, we, we make ourselves uh, suffering. Probably that is what we need. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, that would be, you know, as I said, more, more, more kind of the, the cynical answer to, to things. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, um, you know, I always try to be, be a realist. I mean, look what has been happening uh, over the past 10 years uh, across in renewable energies. I mean, it should be more, could be more. Yes, yes, we heard all that uh, earlier today. Uh, but also, I mean, the, the conscience and the awareness uh, for, for those uh, transformations needed, I mean, it's on the rise, to, at least to say something. You cannot say that 95% of, of our population in the global north uh, are completely stubborn uh, and, and don't want to, to see, don't want to accept these challenges. I mean, it's a tough battle, um, but um, I think there, there is still some, uh, some reason to, to be hopeful. Uh, whether it will be too late or not, well, it depends on what, what too late means. I mean, you've, uh, in the beginning, you, you have mentioned the different uh, um, emission or, or climate uh, scenarios. 
I don't know where we will uh, be in the end, um, but uh, that's also a, a global issue, and not, not only up to, to Germany, Europe, or the global north, but I mean, it's a global challenge where we will be uh, at the end of the 21st century. Let's see. So, so that said, with provoking a bit on us failing to get the funding together on a global scale and to stand up to our responsibilities. Um, but Katrin, you, you're exactly in that space to, to call us to that responsibility, right? And to say, okay, what can we do as a government to maybe help steer the funding and the finances in the right direction? Yeah, and make Behind? Can try? Um, so this is. Okay, I think it, now it works. Yes, perfect. Um, so I will start again. So welcome to my daily struggle: finding the money, um, negotiate for more. Um, so, every year we have a budget negotiation in the parliament. So, the finance ministry um, is creating the budget and then it goes into the parliament and we can negotiate. Um, the problem is, I cannot add more money. I only can negotiate that the money goes from one title to another title. And so, every year, um, or the, I'm only in the parliament since uh, one and a half year and so I had like two budgets to negotiate. Um, I tried to push to, to find ways to negotiate that the money flows in the direction to climate and biodiversity. Uh, the first time uh, we figured out to, um, to negotiate that more than 300 million went into the direction. The second time a little bit more but it's not a big deal. So uh, we are missing billions. And so right now we are in the situation that we are waiting for the finance ministry to, um, to, to, to make the um, budget for next year public so we can start to negotiate. And at the same time, we are trying to influence um, the ministry that um, there is some changing of thinking about how much money should we spend. And so right now we don't have the six billion, so Germany said that they will uh, figure out a way to, um, to give six billion to the hundred billion. Um, but the fair price would be eight billion or more. And still we are under six billion. So this is a huge problem we are facing right now and um, as soon as I get um, the budget we will start to negotiate again. I don't want to switch places with you. I can hear what that's a very intense process, the whole negotiation process. Um, but it's great to have these voices in the parliament to continuously focus on that and push forward. But it's not only the money, Julia. I mean, with money, we also need to transfer other things too. Um, knowledge, competency. I mean, we need to build some kind of competency there on the ground, right? So it's, so what, what can we do there? Is it ex not only money we want to transfer, it's also, thank you, that's what I was hoping for, thank you. It's also the knowledge and coordinating those projects on the ground. Yep. Well, no. Okay, <laughs> second. Well, we see technology sometimes work and sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> and we need some knowledge how to, to work on it. <laughs> 
well, um, definitely we need the knowledge, but as well, there is a lot of knowledge out there. And I was in Africa last year in Uganda, and we had a big event with a lot of startups in the sector of innovations. Um, and they had so many ideas how we can work with regenerative uh, energies. And quite often we, we look from, from the outside, from Europe, and think we have to bring them the ideas, but that's not true. There are many ideas in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. I think the problem often is not that we have, or that we face technical problems. We mostly see implementation problems. We see it as well in Germany. We have the technique, but what hinders us is quite often the implementation. People that are against something in their neighborhood or whatever. And well, in, in Africa, it might be other implementation problems, for example. It's not that a neighborhood says, I don't want to have um, the power plant close to my house, but they need maybe some funding. And I think if we, we are just talking about funding. And so we have to find new ways for, for existing innova innovative ideas and to see how we can promote those ideas and find a way that they are, they can exist on the market. So I think that's the, the biggest problem that we face uh, right now. Yeah, and I think I can I can relate to that in talking about technological problems and especially the space that I usually operate in, talking about technologies and how we can use those for sustainable programs. But then at the same time, are we actually opening the door for a, a neo-colonialism that we're then exporting our technologies, our thoughts, our way of doing things? Um, well, as I said, um, we, I saw that there are so many ideas and we have just to get in an yeah, to, to, to interchange with these people, to, to connect with them. Maybe there are ideas in Africa or Asia that would work here as well. It's not that Europe goes out and tells people how to do it. But on the other hand, I'm sure that right now the world is as well watching at Germany. What are we doing? And can we have the transition to more renewable energies? And if they see we can do it, they will follow. But if they see even Germany can't do it, and we are a strong nation, we have the finance to do it, then we might lose people, and might lose people on the way to have more renewable energies worldwide. Well, one thing that also comes to mind, and thank you, thank you, Julia. Um, I saw of an example of um, a Western company in solar energy exporting a lot of solar panels to a place in Africa and actually taking land away from the farmers so they can install that solar plant, power plant, and then forcing the farmers to a very dependent kind of labor of fixing the solar panels and cleaning the area and then all of a sudden falling into dependent labor locally. So instead of actually enabling something, it actually brought a cultural collapse in that area. Um, so that said, just as an impulse and just to provoke our thinking a bit, um, Mr. Complexity here, um, Benjamin, if I may call you that, because you said you love complexity and you always want to answer things. I never not, said I love complexity. <laughs> you said you love complexity. To, <laughs> but, but you were saying to me that um, we have to appreciate the complexity of it. And uh, there's no one size fits all and this one switch, this one magic wand that we can wave. Yeah, it's true. Um, 
I think um, of all decisions in life, when it comes to how to adapt to climate change, when it comes to migration, there's not only one variable or factor which plays a role. Uh, and that is simply something we, we, we need to, to, to be aware of. But if, if I may uh, come back to uh, the discussion we, we just had um, on, on skills transfer and how to fund it and, and, and all that, uh, I think there's one important factor, and I mean it's also in the title um, of this panel, uh, it's also migration. Migration is uh, a huge economic global factor. Um, and there's a lot of potential. Another economic factor, like now many people will think, uh, well, we have this, uh, how do we call it in Germany sometimes, the immigration into the social systems or something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, the uh, World Bank figures of um, now for, for quite some time around, or even more than 500 million, so a billion US dollars, uh, in money which migrants send to their relatives or friends uh, just to, to, to uh, emerging economies and developing countries alone. And that number is, um, it's not nonsense, but I mean it's just a small portion of, of what is actually being sent. Because, I mean, that is only what is being reported by money transfer organizations, by banks, to the World Bank. Um, I mean, many, many, many migrants also including refugees, like from Syria sending money to, um, uh, sorry, from Germany sending money to, to Syria, for instance, uh, they use informal channels. Um, so we can assume that the actual number, the real number, which nobody knows, I mean, it's, it's much, much, much higher than those 500 US billion dollars. And we also know it's not only about the money and it's not only about consumption, which, uh, you know, people just living on the money and, you know, buying, new mobile phones or something, but it's reinvested, it is used for, for healthcare, it is used for, for education. Um, and I mean, it's also about skills transfer. It's not only about the money, but I mean, there's also a lot of skills transfer. Uh, and right now, I, I started working on a new project, uh, looking actually at the contributions of, of diasporas for climate action in the well, countries of origins where they once originate from. Uh, and there is a lot of, a lot of um, projects, a lot of action, a lot of efforts uh, are going on already. Uh, I think it's also something we, we should not neglect. I mean, it's not only about what um, official development, corporations, agencies do, uh, what, what institutions like Konrad Arnoff, I mean, it's, it's all a lot of good work, but I mean, uh, there's also kind of peer-to-peer of -peer work going on in terms of finance, in terms of skills transfer, and that's, I think quite a huge potential that we sometimes um, neglect a bit, probably. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's a very good point and uh, addresses the complexity of things. When you talk about skills, and I take a look at the audience and also here with um, with very um, knowledge hungry uh, students and with a lot of brain power here, I mean, we're also looking a lot into the future generations of leadership of decision makers of shapers and doers um, i would like to open the floor for questions maybe also from the audience uh, i can imagine that there's probably some things going on in your heads and questions you would like to address to the panel of what we can actually do and what does it actually mean to you um, do we have any questions from from the audience does anybody would like to address the panel So, as always, I start here. I was also on our last colloquium, yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say a huge um, thanks to you all, because you are doing an imagined job that I can only hear about, because I'm still studying. And first of all, my question is about migration um, to Benjamin. Um, you have said that migration has very good impact. But um, on the other hand, we have seen a lot of data that Europe needs um, like around billions of migrants every year to halt uh, the same growth of the economy. And um, on this point, 
um, I have like a doubt that sometimes like politicians they use migration um, to hold their own economy and not like to help African countries because like um, in African countries we see a lot um, brain like flowing into Europe and they did not return so yeah they doing projects for Africa but I think we can do more if we keep this brain in Africa, we develop them, we... So, I want to know uh, your point of view about the situation. Are we collecting or should I... Um, well, keeping brains in Africa. Um, <laughs> there is this idea that, you know, if you generate let's say, via the means of, of trade or, or was also with the means of development cooperation, you can accelerate economic growth in, in the countries of origin, uh, so more wealth is created, incomes uh, are rising, so people will stay. But, I mean, in economic um, migration research, we know for, like, the last 20 or 30 years uh, that there's something called the migration hump, which means that, I mean, if a country's economy is accelerating, usually the desire of people to migrate uh, will also be on the rise. Um, it's, it's because also, um, I mean, there are many reasons for that, the demographic reasons, uh, there is a growing youth bulge in those economies in those countries, there are networking effects, anyways. So in the end, usually the desire to migrate is, is on the rise when um, economies are growing and, and when countries are, let's say, moving away from a least developed country status uh, to, towards the, the middle income area somewhat. Uh, somewhat. So um, migration, and I think, is something we, we all need to accept. We, we, we shouldn't need to, to romanticize migration as, I mean, something which is um, uh, a solution to all kinds of economic problems. That is not, definitely not what I wanted to say. I mean, there's a lot of exploitation going on uh, a lot of, uh, economically speaking, social costs, which are usually hidden uh, in, in, in a lot of equations. And I think it's always better to, to, um, to, to accept that migration is going on. And um, keeping brains somewhere is probably not, also not the best solution, because, I mean, economically speaking, uh, we moved away from the brain drain um, to brain circulation, meaning that, um, well, people are migrating, yes, but, I mean, they are always keeping um, in, in communication, uh, in, in the transfer, talked about it, you know, uh, skills transfer, of course, financial transfers, and it's like, good, I mean, if, if those people are also allowed to, to, to go back for some time, and probably if, uh, for, some, for one reason or the other, they want to go back to the, uh, the country they once migrated, you let them. It's, it's always best if something is circulating than if something uh, is, you know, just being locked somewhere. Um, so better to, to, to strive for circulation than for keeping something in one place. Thanks. And if I may add one point, um, the people quite often we see that they come to Europe or the States, um, and even if they stay there, they will be, like he, Benjamin said, in contact with the place where they come from. And they as well might bring the ideas from Europe and the US back to their countries and they can send money. There is a high amount of remittances that goes back to the countries and that as well can help in the topic of climate change. So they can send money to restructure things, uh, to, to build things, to, to have more adaptation measures over there. So it's not only a bad thing if they, they leave the country, but of course we have as well to find, have people that go back after they have studied here, for example, or whatever. So it's always both sides of a battle. So. Mm -hmm. But I can also imagine that this also needs frameworks, and this also needs um, incentives. If we talk about the brain in, for instance, continental Africa, 
I mean, Africa is not equal Africa. We're talking about 55 different countries, and uh, and they all have different different challenges. And um, there's a technology map of I don't know 650 startup and innovation hubs already in Sub-Saharan Africa, from Lagos to Accra. IBM has invested a, into a big AI hub in Accra. So it's actually building skills locally. Yeah, but how, do, how can we also keep them there if part of their regions turn unattractive because impacted by, by climate change? And I don't want to simplify too much, but um, Katrin, I can imagine that, that you are also very interested in how we can set up here governmental frameworks and incentivize economy to maybe also invest into other countries or is that also part of your your focus first of all i think um oh, okay is this better <laughs> um so first of all, I think it's very important that we have a just a system if people need to flee, um, that they can find safe routes to come through us, or safe routes to different regions of the world where they can live safely. And right now we have like huge problem at the border of Europe. And so I'm, I, I fear that the response, because um, already in the US, but also in Europe, there is some more and more racist um, discussion about migration, about people who need to flee, um, that, that um, it, it, we will face the problem of uh, more and more repression against people who are trying to come to us to find a safe place. Um, and I, so for me, it's it's very important that um, the right the right to live in a safe place, to, the right to flee, um, the, the right to mi migrate, it should be the same for every human. And so also there is the, the huge question about why in some regions there are cruel conflicts. Um, and of course, climate crisis is one of the reasons. Um, and so there's also a question about global responsibility. And this is why uh, finding ways like the loss and damage funds, um, finding ways like the one billion, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> like 100 billion for climate finance, um, to find ways to repair, but also to find ways to um, to reduce um, the the source of of the reasons why people need to flee, and so of course there is we we need to do more for protection our climate. Of course, we have to change also our economic system, um, and should consider um, creating a new kind of global economy. Um, where it's not about attractivism because, well, I, one example in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, there is a huge conflict going on um, and one of the reasons of this conflict, one of the reasons is, of course, the resources in these regions and also the interest from um, other countries into the minerals and so we have to learn to, to live um, a, a more just in a more just uh, world and a more just economy and I think to, to consider this would be like very important. No, thank you very much. Um, I think it makes total sense. Um, there's so much to still to talk about. Uh, no, I'm fine, I think we can, I'll, I'll work with this. Um, just want to be sure we have enough microphones here available, enough technology available. Um, but I also saw some more hands in the audience, some more questions or impulses or um, counter thoughts. I see a hand up back there. Yes, uh, so mainly to Dr. Schraven. Um, looking back into the past, it took a long time to build the development aid structures we have in place today. 
as you said, um, challenges like yeah, structures here and there. Um, how do we get money and knowledge um, to the right places efficiently? Um, so with the added challenge of building climate resilience now, what gives you hope that it gets much better and faster this time? Well, as I already said before, I mean, uh, people also in the global north uh, are increasingly aware of uh, the impacts uh, of climate change. I look where, where I live in the northern part of Bavaria. Um, I mean, in, in, in three out of four last summers, uh, the lawns were, were looking like, you know, I used to work in, in, uh, in the West African savannah region, and it looked actually like that. Uh, and I mean, we were hot summer nights, um, and I mean, uh, issues with water. I mean, that will not go away, rather the opposite, right? Uh, and I think this awareness uh, will also increase, despite all those, um, excuse my, my, my French nonsense uh, debates now we have about uh, the heating change and, and all, all that in Germany. Uh, people are increasingly aware and people are also in Germany, uh, not only in other parts of the world, also in Germany and Europe are suffering because of these more and more visible effects and, and feelable effects of climate change. Uh, so that is, uh, although it really sounds again a bit cynical, but I think it really uh, might be uh, a decisive and important factor uh, why there's still hope that, I mean, um, countries like Germany will provide hopefully someday, also more funding uh, for, for issues we, we just talked about, like the loss and damage fund and, and other funding instruments. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we've heard now the loss and damage fund as one of the big instruments that was discussed also in the last COP, or actually the last two or three COPs, but now with, uh, with the last um, climate summit. Uh, is, is that going to be then the solution when we have enough money that people feel committed and economies feel committed and governments feel committed and say, now we have to do it? Is that enough pressure? Open question. So, um, to have enough money helps, but it's not everything. So, um, is this okay or should I use this? Okay. So, um, of course, it's important to have enough money and to, um, well, to uh, de-invest. So, to, to move the money from invest, investation into fossil fuel industry to invest in a, a truly just and green transition. Um, but it's not only the question about the money, it's also a question about what we discussed in the beginning of this panel about democracy. Uh, how we can achieve a true democratic way um, that the, the voices of different uh, groups are getting heard um, and also how to support each other. And if I understand, understood also the question correctly, it was about hope, was it? And so for me, hope... Um, because while well, in the Rhineland, in my region, I, there were a lot of a huge battles we had um, against the coal mine industry. And sometimes we won and sometimes we lost. And we won that there, there is still there the Hambacher Forest still standing. Uh, we won that there are still standing five villages, but we lost also a lot. We lost villages, we lost a huge part of the forest. Um, and so that to, to uh, well, to, to be in this movement, to be there together with other peoples who, people who are truly invested in uh, trying to achieve um, a different kind of society, a different way of living, um, and truly um, invest in, in a future, a climate just future. Um, this gives me hope, a lot of hope. And so right now, what it gives me hope is that there in Brazil, there's um, right now a huge uh, protest from indigenous group against the Congress, which is more, um, well, very, oh, the biggest part of the Congress is very close to the agro-business. 
um, and they try to to weaken the, the rights of indigenous territories. Um, but the indigenous communities, they are struggling against this very powerful, very hard. And so hope for me is when I look into these struggles and how people are fighting so fearless, um, especially in regions where they are facing hard repressions. Um, for example, in, um, in Uganda, um, right now, a civil society, um, so members of civil society who are fighting against the ECOP, it's a new oil pipeline built by uh, Total Energy, a European company. Um, and civil society, they are facing huge repression from the state. Um, but still they're continuing their strikes. Um, still they speak up. And so this is something which gives me hope, is the, the struggle of other peoples and building, building this, this type of climate justice movement. And I guess hope is also probably part of the DNA of, the, of our next generation. I mean, I think just speaking about myself, I grew up in a time where climate, of course the studies were always around from the big oil companies about how CO2 is going to impact the environment. But our generation grew up as this is another topic. And I think our next generation is growing up with this is the topic. It doesn't matter which political affiliation I have, it is a topic that runs through all sectors of society. So maybe that is also to add some of that hope. It's the pressure of suffering, in a sense, but it's also a reality that our generation is also leaving behind, as sad as that is. Are there any more Questions from the audience. See some hands flying up. Um, I was wondering if any of you have looked at the um, topic of climate migration from a post colonial point of view. Um, because I think it would be important to understand why countries in the global south are more vulnerable. Can you hear me? I think we, can, we couldn't make it out. Could you repeat the question, please? I was wondering if any of you look at the topic of climate migration from a post-colonial point of view. Yeah. So the question is about how we see climate migration from a post-colonial point of view. Yes, because I, want, I, I think that um, it would be important to also see the responsibility of the global north and to understand why and um, and I was wondering um, what role uh, colonial reparations could play and um, yeah oh, wow I think that could be a topic for another another panel that's it's an amazing topic I love it by the way but who would like to jump on that we, we can we all can we can take turns <laughs> I don't, don't want to jump, but um, yeah, yes, it's true. Um, if if you look at um, how climate change and new mobility or different forms of migration are connected, uh, we said it now several times before. It's quite complex, and it's not only about climate change and other factors play a role. Um, and this. Climate mobility, let me, let me call that like that. I could also say uh, human mobility in the context of climate change was always a bit long. But this climate mobility is usually not um, a form of migration um, which is like migration form sui generis. So it's not something new. But I mean, climate change is, let's say, feeding into already existing migration systems. Uh, for instance, in West Africa, uh, that is where, where I lived and I worked and, and also I've been looking at um, those connections and, and migration systems. Um, there's a lot of seasonal migration. That means people, uh, traditionally only men, now for the past 20 to 30 years, increasingly also women, uh, leave their households during the, the, um, the dry season when there is no rain-fed agriculture possible. Uh, they go to um, the coastal areas where there is commercial agriculture. They go to the informal sector of the cities. 
stay there until the end of the dry season, at least traditionally, return, hopefully they've earned some money, um, and then they, they continue with rain-fed farming in their home communities. That is a migration system uh, which was virtually enforced by the colonial powers. But the British colonial authorities, the French did some, something similar, uh, and it still exists up to this very day. And that is also where, uh, at least basically, it exists like that. And that is also something uh, where, where climate change is increasingly uh, playing a role, because, I mean, people need to compensate for the losses and the damage uh, uh, being induced by, by uh, different forms of, of hazards related to climate change. Um, I think, uh, yes, I mean, when it comes to compensation for those uh, colonially uh, induced systems, um, beats me now. Um, but I mean, I would definitely second Pascal. Uh, that should be definitely the topic for, for another panel discussion. Yes, maybe we can, maybe we can use that as an opening for the last round. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Um, because we have to slowly come to a close. Um, Julia, you want to build on that? Um, well, maybe as well, of course, there are as well a lot of crises in Africa that might well, in a, have their origin in the colonial times. We can see that, that we have borders that were just drawn somewhere far away from Africa. And all these crises are now multiplied because of climate change. Um, that might be as well be a, um, some of the explanation of the migrations that we see now. But on the other hand, migration was always part of uh, the patterns in, in Africa. Um, so. Well, we, we cut it as well as our migration routes. Or today we see that we have the, I already to, uh, talked about the herders and farmers conflict, that you have the farmers and the herders now have to move from parts where they were before and they come into regions where the farmers live and you have the conflicts. And that was part of the colonial times that some conflicts arose but um, are now well um, heat up because of climate change and of course um, we are definitely um, the countries uh, the industrialized country who are the original of the climate change that's for sure as well and we have now to to talk to the countries and to find solutions together. So we can't say, well, it's not our problem, it's far away, that, that won't work. But, well, we definitely don't do that. It, it's, it's a long way, it's a difficult way. And I'm sure that if you see the outcomes of COP and other conferences, you might not be happy all the time and say, hey, yes, we, we go a step forward. But you have to see as well that how many countries come together and all the countries that go to COP, they see that we have to do something and that we can't just be here and watch what will happen. And there we are back to the topic of hope. That gives me hope that so many countries come together and see that climate change is real and we have to work now. Um, first, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. And um, so I think first we, um, well, Europe and also Germany um, still has to do a lot about histor historical research about um, their colonial history. Um, it's something we are, not, we are not learning enough in school. It's not something we are not learning enough in university. And it's something we are not discussing enough in our political discourse. And so it's, it's very important that we um, take their responsibility for the cruelty of the past, but also what's happening right now. And um, so there, there's like one example 
that I think is very interesting and we are working on this right now is, um, well, it's an idea which comes from the Global South. It's called Climate Debts that uh, we are releasing um, countries from their debt because um, right now the climate crisis is, um, well, in, in a lot of countries already um, is threatening the, the growth of wealth and so to release the debt would be like one step so but it's like a little step in this direction it cannot be everything and so also for me because the well the topic of the panel was climate crisis and migration um, i think it's very important that we don't close our borders um, that we we are not building any more borders um, um, well, trying to hold people back, so but that we are find a, a just um, a system that people who are fleeing to us, the people who are migrate to us, that they that they don't die um, at at sea, and that they are also not um, left at refugees camp like in Lesbos or um, in Bosnia. So this is like very very important. Yes, thank you very much, and I. Thank you also for the question for our last round because it's very important. Um, I will also take the impulse and discuss with the HFE uh, Vorstand that maybe that could be a topic for another discussion round or panel. Um, so just to close off, and I'm sorry that we can't take all the hands that were raised. Um, so to round it off, climate change and migration, it has a lot to do with responsibility and taking a look at 400 years of colonialism and how are the next 400 years going to look like. Talking about reparations means to understand the total value chain of responsibility. We have been producing profit and offloading that onto nature. That's why we've been so profitable. So I think we have to rethink a lot of things from a systemic perspective. And migration is one point. It's something knocking on our door, literally, maybe as a wake-up call, but there is hope. Thanks for that impulse, and thank you so much to this wonderful panel. I can say I think I've learned a lot discussing with you, and I hope that was also the same for you as the audience. So thank you very much, Katrin. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you for your patience. Sorry with the microphones, but I hope you could take something out of this for today. Thank you. I think there is one more before everybody leaves. I think there's one more little goodie, and I think somebody would like to announce that. Another video statement. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, exactly. So now we're going to have a 20, 25 minute break with uh, some snacks again. And then afterwards, we're going to be discussing China and the European Union and Dependency, interdependency, and what could, uh, what effects China can have on us here. So, please don't run away. Take some snacks. Come back, and we're going to continue. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>